Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Kansas City Public Library. Uh, I'm Crosby Kemper, the director of the Kansas City Public Library. It's a pleasure to have uh, Phil White here tonight. Uh, from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic to Olathe, Kansas, where, where <laughs> Phil White, where Phil White uh, comes from uh, and uh, has, written, has written this uh, wonderful book. It, it's an extraordinary story. Uh, this is one of the six or seven greatest speeches, most important speeches, most consequential speeches uh, in the history of the world, I believe. Uh, I've written about it myself. Uh, and uh, this, this speech in Fulton, Missouri, with the President of the United States and the former Prime Minister uh, of England uh, uh, on, the, on the stage together, uh, set the tone for, uh, created uh, the first, uh, in, in essence, uh, battle uh, in, the, in the history of the Cold War. Uh, and, at, and at the beginning, uh, because of Churchill's great rhetoric, uh, led to, uh, in fact, the first victory. As, as I've written about, the consequence of this uh, included uh, a moment when uh, uh, Beetle Smith uh, became, who was an executive officer to General Eisenhower during World War II, was named ambassador to Russia by Truman, went to Russia right after the speech, had no instructions, and Stalin called him into his office at one in the morning and said, is this the policy of the United States? And Smith, not knowing whether it was the policy of the United States, but assuming whatever Winston Churchill would say, must indeed be the policy of the United States, said yes. And Stalin went into the next room in which the Shah's sister, the Shah of Iran's sister was, and announced to her that he was willing to pull Russian troops out of Iran who were there illegally, in my belief, the first victory of the Cold War. It is interesting that there has never been a book-length study of this most important speech until Phil White, who is a, uh, a, an amateur, a private scholar. Actually, I don't think after the publication of this book I can say amateur anymore because this is a wonderful narrative history. Andrew Roberts, John Lucas, Kirkus Reviews uh, all, all confirm this. Uh, John Lucas has said about it, uh, I read our supreme task with considerable care and I recommend it emphatically. There is now an enormous literature about the Cold War but very little about how it actually came about and almost nothing about this address. This book fills the gap and fills it uh, brilliantly. Uh, Phil has been a writer and lecturer at Mid-American Nazarene University, a regular contributor to the Historical Society uh, of Boston uh, University. Uh, he's a business writer, member of the Public Relations Society uh, uh, of America, and a, frequently, a frequent contributor to Canoe and Kayak, which must somehow have pre uh, uh, prepared him uh, for this speech. Uh, but it's a, a, a very good book about a very important topic, uh, and uh, you will be able to uh, get, buy copies from our friends at Barnes & Noble uh, uh, in the hall, and Phil will sign afterwards and also take your questions. And ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce Phil White. These aren't my notes. Yeah, these are my notes, which is good. It's a lie. Um, Thank you so much to Crosby Kemper for the kind introduction, um, to Henry Fortunato as well, Lorenzo Butler, Todd Boyer, and the rest of the Kansas City Public Library team. Thank you also to Rob Havers from driving all the way up from Fulton and everyone at the National Churchill Museum, and to those at Mid-American Nazarene University um, who decided through a combination of bribery and coercion that co-sponsoring this event would be a good idea. <laughs> Um, and speaking of bribery, um, looking around the audience, I see a few familiar faces. And uh, it's nice to know that, in fact, lining the pockets is still a good way to get people to turn out for this type of thing. <laughs> so the only catch being that those who I have come to an agreement with have to stay till the end. So please try to remember that. Uh, the rest of you are free to leave if the security guards will let you out. Um, now, this week I was rereading the acknowledgments in my book. And... Uh, was truly amazed by how many people were involved. And in seeing all these names, uh, I realized that why, while it is indeed a book about history, about the struggle between tyranny and liberty, and about one of the defining moments of the 20th century, it is, first and foremost, a book about people. Now, some of these uh, you won't have heard of until after this talk, when, whether or like, you like it or not, you will. Um, 
But looming large uh, over my narrative is one of the people that you probably have heard of, Winston Churchill. Now, there have been lots of books written about Winston Churchill, and you may have wondered, why write another? Um, but while there have been many volumes on his early life, on his wilderness years, when he was warning of Hitler's rise to power, and, of course, on Churchill's wartime triumph, little has been written about his post-war life, and indeed, as Crosby rightly said, about how this speech came about. Indeed, many people don't know that just weeks after millions of Londoners cheered Churchill through the streets on VE Day, Victory in Europe Day, in May of 1945, they voted him out of office in a landslide defeat, some reward for the man who had led his country, and in many ways the democratic West, to victory over tyranny. It was, in fact, the second worst election loss in the history of the Conservative Party, and one that gave the Labour Party its first majority government. Now, during the campaign, Labour looked forward to the post-world world, uh, needs of new housing, of caring for wounded soldiers, and, right or wrong, of constructing a welfare state. In contrast, the Conservatives really just relied on Churchill's reputation and his record of war leader, understandably in some ways. But they failed to propose strong alternatives to Labour's plans. And really, Churchill's opponent, opponent the head of the Labour Party, Clement Attlee, frankly just outworked him on the campaign trail. Despite these facts, and Attlee holding a double-digit lead in the weeks leading up to the election, Churchill's advisers were convinced that he would still win, and somehow they convinced him too. Yet, when election day came in July of 1945, the voters wanted to move on from Churchill's wartime coalition. Attlee was their man, the Labour Party was in, and Winston Churchill, at age 70, was out. Churchill was a dynamo, writing more than 40 books, hundreds of magazine articles, and, of course, composing many memorable speeches. He juggled this with his political responsibilities with aplomb, calling on many beleaguered secretaries at all hours of the day and night to transcribe his lofty prose. He was, in fact, in the habit of only transcribing and wrote little in his own hand. Even letters to his wife were actually written by his secretaries. But with his election defeat came inertia, loss of purpose, and self-doubt. Was he finished as a politician? Would he ever again be able to return as leader? How had the British people neglected him after he had led them to victory over Hitler? All these nagging questions plagued his mind. And when he left the Prime Minister's weekend estate, Chequers, for what he assumed would be the last time, Churchill wrote a single solemn word in the leather-bound guest book on the table, fini, the French word for finish or stop. And when his beloved wife, Clementine, who had stood at his side for all these years, tried to cheer Churchill up by telling him that the election defeat may actually be a blessing in disguise, he said very glumly, at this moment, it seems to be quite effectively disguised. <laughs> now, another reason for Churchill's gloom in the summer of 1945 was that he had unfinished business with Stalin. And the Russian people uh, that had sacrificed so much, and now Churchill believed, were being led by a man who wanted little different than what Hitler had wanted in World War II, namely the expansion of his powers and his doctrine. Now, just days before the election results, Churchill had sat across t the table from Stalin at the Potsdam Conference in Germany, where he was trying to make Russia honor the, the Yalta J Declaration, which was signed by the Russian Premier, Franklin Roosevelt, now since deceased, and Winston Churchill himself just weeks before. This had promised the exiled Polish leaders seats in the new government and free democratic elections here and in other Eastern European countries, which the Red Army has supposedly liberated from tyranny, only to replace it with another, possibly even greater tyranny of communism. But Stalin had broken these promises one by one, setting up his own communist puppet administration in Poland and refusing to withdraw the Red Army troops from Iran. He wanted more German land and resources, though millions of people had already been displaced and the nation would pay billions of dollars in reparations to the Kremlin. 
The Russians also demanded military bases in Turkey and access to the Suez Canal.